situation. So my mother would say that we're moving in this race relation, race relations difficulty that we're dealing with right now and all of it. We're moving from scabs to scars. It's not an open wound, right? The scab is ugly, but it's better than an open wound. It's a process. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Linda Laurel. Welcome to Our Voices Matter, a podcast dedicated to empowering us all to better understand each other. Our goal, to replace fear with knowledge, disdain with respect, and hate with love, one story at a time. So let's get to it. special guest with us today, one of my longtime friends, former colleague from KPRC Channel 2. We sat on the anchor desk together for many years when you did sports and I did news. So let me just give a quick little rundown of his background, okay? So he's got a, what, a championship with University of Oklahoma, okay, in the Orange Bowl Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Also have a Super Bowl ring from the San Francisco 49ers, 1989 played for the Houston Oilers. Mm -hmm. Those are just the highlights, okay? There's a whole lot of other stuff. (laughs) Spencer Tillman, ladies and gentlemen. So glad to have you with us. Good to see you. She was the real talent, by the way. I just kind of pretended and played sports. That's all. How are you? You look so beautiful. Oh, thank you. It is just so great to see you. It's been way too long. And, you know, when I started the podcast, I knew that I wanted to interview you because Mm. You are so much bigger than your your sports career, mm-hmm. and you're now a broadcaster. You've worked for CBS Sports. Mm-hmm. Um, you're currently working for Fox Sports, yeah. correct? Mm-hmm. And also here locally in Houston for the ABC affiliate KTRK. Right. So you're doing all of your broadcasting, but what else are you into these days? There's a lot that's going on. Uh, I, Linda, I think probably the succinct way to say it is um, we are merging all of those assets and skills that you talk about to do more. The project that I'm excited excited about more thing than anything else is the Lombardi Honors. Uh, it's an event that we set up working in conjunction with the Lombardi family to celebrate Vince Lombardi's leadership. Um, we've got a kind of a seven institutional model. We can kind of unpack that a little bit later on. But the bottom line is this. We are leveraging that asset to make culture stronger. Uh, there's a lot of Gallup research out there that talks about where we are as a nation and as a country, and we're trying to address that. I mean, for example, you know, this is the first generation that will not eclipse their parents in terms of economic mobility, you know, moving from one socioeconomic mm-hmm. quintile to the next as a matter of course. And rather than getting bogged down in, in those drivers that are contributing to that, we know the drivers are. We're trying to find solutions to amp people up, get them ready to disearn those threats, and then to come up with strategies and coping mechanisms that will allow them to thrive in this 21st century context. And it really comes back down to resiliency. We now know that resilience, and I know you're brilliant, you got that Stanford degree, and you're just <laughs> off the charts, you know, intelligentsia. But what's happened, Linda, you now have people in Bangalore, India, and China. The technology that you're using to put this event on right now, I mean, this podcast, and this, this, this information is being gathered from really some very, very modern this equipment, right? Mm -hmm. But that person in Bangalore, India, and China from a lean-to can create an algorithm and sell it and displace someone here in the United States, and they don't even know exactly what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So the competition pool goes from 320 million or so here in America to literally billions of people around the world. So the implications of that are profound. You're not competing against that cohort. You're competing against billions of people. So I'm interested to understand how the Lombardi Awards, and for those who are watching, okay, so I'm hoping we have some young young ones out there who are watching who might not know who Vince Lombardi was. Okay, so real quickly, tell them who Vince Lombardi was and and how how you're using his name and his legacy to do what you're you're describing. Well, when it comes to playoff football, Vince Lombardi is the winningest coach ever, right? We know Bill Belichick more recently may be the guy that for most people can identify, but the first few technical Super Bowls, the first two were won by the Green Bay Packers and Vince Lombardi in Green Bay at the time, an expansion program that nobody really wanted to go to. And then, of course, the six of the first seven Super Bowls, technically, they were called championships prior to the first two. He won them. I mean, that's unprecedented success. So what we did is basically captured his leadership approach. 
approach and then create a leadership model out of it. And we propagate that in school systems like here in the Cypress Fairbanks School District. Uh, we had Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley High School went through the program last year. We had literally over 17,000 kids go through the program. Our objective is to get to 700,000. That's what we want to do. And if we can do that, Linda, we'll be at a place where we'll be able to affect America in terms of net productivity. That is to say, uh, if we can get 700,000 kids to go through this program and stay in school and graduate, it will confer a net benefit of $1.2 trillion over a nine year period. That is real money. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help America become more resilient. And so we talk about economic mobility. Yeah. A, big, a big piece of that or a driver of it is, is this divide yeah. that we have yeah. because you've got one, one group that is more economically upwardly mobile mm -hmm. because of societal forces. And mm -hmm. then you have another group that is not. Yeah. And so what you're trying to do is to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, th that's it. And we're trying to work through two primary things, if you will, education, job creation. That's mm -hmm. it. Um, Gallup tells us those are the two most important social values for the next 50 years because of those factors that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. And unless people can recognize that and then adapt the mindsets and the attitudes to compete in a new context, they're not going to be successful. So the news is grim if we do not acknowledge that. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I always equate stuff to football sense. And if you tell me from a football standpoint, I come to the line of scrimmage like a quarterback and we all are quarterbacks right of our lives. Football is life. I've always felt that way. You come to the line of scrimmage of your circumstance. The first thing I'm trying to do is discern where the threats are. By alignment, I can tell where people are. We can do the same thing in our lives. When I see that the job context is being squeezed, that's a threat. So what do I do in response to that? I got to call a play, get more education, whatever it is, or a series of plays over time that gives me the best chance to succeed against that threat. And then I've got to execute it every single day. So it's like a one, two, three step process. Discern threat, call plays to give you the best chance to succeed against those threats and then execute those every single day to close that divide that you talked about. What do you think is the the biggest threat that we're facing um, yeah. since you use that word? Yeah. Um, and. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, again, about our civil discourse and mm -hmm. the fact that we are seeming to have such a difficult time listening to each other, talking to each other in a respectful manner. Um, what What is the biggest threat, do you think? You know what? I think, Linda, that's such a brilliant question. We live in a world of images and impressions, right? Most people aren't interested in pulling away the veneer to find out what's really substantive underneath mm -hmm. that. So we deal with what's on the surface. Mm -hmm. When we see people moving and are upwardly mobile, we consider them threats. Uh, if you're a part of a demographic that has enjoyed a level of privilege in this nation, you have to understand that we are not trying to substitute one tyranny for another. That has never been our position. We have come here with a servant attitude in many regards by force, or by option, you know, as the case may have been. The bottom line is this, we need to understand that we all are functioning in the same context. We all want the same things. We are all facing the same threats and challenges. And this is the greatest fake out in the world. Skin and race is, a, is an illusion. It's the fake out, it's the easy low line fruit to differentiate ourselves. And it's one of the oldest tactics that rich folks have used for many millennia to separate people who otherwise would work together. I mean, you go back and look in the history books and study things like Bacon's Rebellion. You'll find poor whites and poor blacks working side by side. Why? Because someone had the ability to understand that, guess what? Our interests are the same. Mm -hmm. it's the and we're stronger that, if we work yeah. together. And the folks that have all the money, irrespective of what color they were, they're the ones that's running the show. So we need to come together and you want to keep me out of your unions and keep me a part of the, 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 the construct of our society that makes it work. No, you shouldn't do that because if we come together, we'll have strength in those union arrangements so that we can deal with those few that are making the controls and then, of course, causing us to fight one another. That division is what allows a few people to remain in control of institutions. So I think the greatest threat is the illusion that this is the problem. This skin is not color. the problem. Skin color is yeah, not skin the color is not the problem. Huh. No, it's the illusion of losing something that we have either felt entitled to or because of forces of nature and history 
have put us in a position to it's that, occupy. It's that scarcity mentality. Oh, yeah. You know, there's yes. not enough. Yes. You know, I want mine. I yeah. want what's mine. And and if I have what I want, then that means you can't have what you want. You know what? But you there's know, enough for all of us. Absolutely. And, and that's a principle of John Lombardi. He talks about what his grandfather, Vince Lombardi, the scarcity model is what he calls it. He says, imagine you're in a room and you've got um, 11 people in this room and you've got a pizza that's there, but there's only nine pieces. He says, everybody scrambles to get those nine until somebody says, guess what? We've got some dough over here. Let's make another pie. Let's make another pizza, right? Enterprise we have the resources. Absolutely, to do it. we've got the resources. Let's make yeah. another one. Yeah. Yeah. So that enterprise architecture, and so the, the response has been more of a protectionist response. Let's grab what's left for ours. Hey, get some ingenuity together. Let's put something together so we can all eat and have fun and partake. That's what's really all about. So we're trying to foster that whole enterprise architecture. That's part of the Lombardi way, right? Uh, so we're having fun doing it. That's great. Yeah. I, I can't wait to watch how this unfolds and yeah. progresses. Um, so I have to ask you about this whole controversy in the NFL with the players taking a knee. Yeah. Okay. What's your What's your take on all of it? Well, I think the problem was uh, Colin Kaepernick in the early part of that whole thing. And I remember when it happened, because I was doing the preseason game in, in San Francisco when it happened. I didn't think much of it at the time. I saw him on the bicycle. I never really thought anything of it. But in hindsight, we obviously know what has since transpired. He allowed forces that are part of the cohort that's challenging and is disruptive to take control of his narrative. Mm -hmm. He delivered a very salient point for why he was doing what he did, but he did it one time. The difficult truth is you can take a lie and you can make it become truth if you say it enough and enough and enough and enough. Nobody heard his truth enough and frequently enough so that he could battle the forces that tried to turn it into a battle and disrespect of the flag or the anthem. And the difficult truth is, you know, listen, I wear the American flag every single day. If you see me have a coat on, I got the American flag on. I know. I, and when, remember, and, I remember that yeah. all, our, all our days together. Yeah. But when people ask me, Linda, why I wear it, I wear it because it represents what she is on her best days. That's why I wear it. America is still a work in progress. She is trying to get to that, that sense of perfection where she needs to be. And I have confidence that she will get there. And so the Colin Kaepernick deal is disappointing. Um, and, and again, I think this late, latest thing that has transpired with this um, mutual quiet agreement that they have, non-disclosure, yeah. mm -hmm. it leaves more questions than answers mm -hmm. that are out there. And I'm disappointed in the camp for that. Uh, there needs to be some kind of narrative out there that says, hey, look, all of the people that said that they wouldn't uh, perform at a halftime or at a, an NFL game who supported you, they need to some closure on this. They need to know what they stood up for. What was this about? What are you going to do with the resources that came your way? Are there programs? What's the NFL going to do? You know, do they get the yeah, part and go their been, separate way? Yeah, too many. Total silence. Too many. It. So I think that's irresponsible for how they've handled that portion of it. I think there's some things that you can extrapolate from the outcome because the NFL is the NFL. They don't do anything that they don't have to do. I can tell you that from personal experience. The fact that they settled this case, there had to be enough evidence there that put them at a level of jeopardy, right? But also, Colin Kaepernick and whoever was a party to his challenge needs to understand that there's another narrative that needs to be addressed. These people, us, everyone needs to have closure. Mainstream America, and for the most part, needs closure. They need to know that they don't need to fear us. We don't disrespect the flag. It's not the anthem. We don't have any disrespect. You know, we love our military family members and uh, I've got military throughout my family. That's not what it is. It's what America comports to be and reflects and says it is more often than not for one cohort than it does for those that look more like us. And that's what it was all about. That's it's what it's always about. You're the first person that I've, I've heard, because I've asked this question of other people, um, and you're the first person that I've heard say that he didn't articulate his narrative no, he didn't. frequently enough so that it was overriding the counter narrative right. that was there and became you know, became, it became effusive. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all you could hear and see was, was the counter -narr narrative instead of what he really was trying to say. And the irony of that is he is, you know, he was on the team at the San Francisco 49ers with a guy who I have the utmost respect for. And during your time out in California, you may have known who Dr. Harry Edwards was. Oh, yes. Uh, our Absolutely. team psychologist and Absolutely. sociologist from Cal Berkeley. And um, he was the one in my locker. I can, I, the hair stands up on the back of my neck just thinking about some of the things he used to tell me sitting in, in our seats, in our lockers. He gave me that phrase, 
about living in a world of images and impressions and people not being able to discern or being willing to discern what is truth from what is not. Mm. Dr. Edwards is the one that gave me that sense. And so um, when I think guys like, you know, he works for the 49ers, he's a consultant. He mm -hmm. was our team consultant when I was there, our team psychologist. We were the only team in the NFL that had a psychologist. And I know Dr. Edwards knows how to handle this. We can go all the way back to 69 Olympics, which he was very much involved in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so there was someone there. And I think he was actually trying to help. He was trying to keep his, his hands off from a distance mm -hmm. for, to some degree. But uh, in the end, I think Doc probably, and I'm not speaking for him because I haven't really talked to him recently about this latest outcome mm -hmm. uh, as far as the, the settlement is concerned. But I do believe that he probably would have wanted some more closure, um, constructive closure. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, it'll be it'll be. Um Interesting and telling, I think, to see what, if anything, Collins does going forward. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And, He's got the big deal with Nike, yeah. you know, and that could help. And they're yeah. pretty creative. They're bold. Yeah, I, I, I hope, I hope he, he uses those resources, as you say, to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to move forward. Yeah. So one of the questions that I, I ask all of our guests mm -hmm. is to think about a time in their lives when, um, when you've been the other, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, what was, did you have anything in your childhood or during your, your time as a football <laughs> player, whether, you know, at OU or with the 49ers mm -hmm. or the Oilers, is there anything that stands out in your mind where you just really felt like you were the other? The how, other. And how did you handle it? Mm. I'm sure there were a lot of them. Um, maybe one that comes to mind was in high school. You know, you, you have some degree of athletic prowess and um, that makes you big man on campus. Right. Right. Uh, but then there are the realities that set in. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, North Tulsa, and um, we didn't have much growing up. Linda, we, we used to joke and say we, we were broke as the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't have much money at all. And so but when integration came about, we um, we were being bused over to North South Tulsa, which was the more affluent area. Right. So we'd have to wake, wake up maybe two and a half, three hours earlier than everybody else did and take that long jaunt over to South Tulsa. To the point, um, as I you know, moved throughout my athletic career, it was a good thing you know, uh, to be a big fish in a relatively small pond. Everybody celebrates you. But there was a tradition that our cheerleaders had to go to the homes of the athletes, right? And to dress up their homes and their rooms or whatever to let them know how much they were appreciated. And, uh, you know, that was tough because I remember I didn't really want them to come to my home. Mm -hmm. Because my home was not like the homes I went to see there. And so um, we, we struggle with that. I struggle with it. And I remember seeing all the cheerleaders uh, and wondering what they thought about our condition, because we know when they got back to Tulsa Edison, everything was great in the gym. And so I always felt like the other in those situations because we didn't have what they had, but we um, I made it uh, a cause to, to change that. And I did. And before my mother passed away, one of the things we did, we built her brand new home right on the top of the hill, Gilcrease Hills, as pretty a place as I could find, you know, and that was my goal to do that. You were and, so uh, close to your mom. I remember. Yeah. I remember. She was a big influence in your life. Huge, uh, huge influence. She was a missionary. She did a lot of traveling internationally and uh had a dad at home. Dad was great, you know, quiet influence in my life, consistent, showed me exactly what it meant to be a man in the strictest sense of the definition. But my mother was the sage stalwart that was always there, Linda. She was um, um, the type of person that would drop what we call nuggets in your ear. Mm -hmm. Just levels of wisdom that belied her education, even though she got her college degree, she put herself through school. Her level of intuitiveness merged with intelligence was uncanny. And I really didn't appreciate it fully until I graduated. Uh, I could sit here and tell you all kinds of stories about some of the things that she did that set her apart. Uh, my mother was truly a unique person. And uh, when she passed away, um, it left a huge void. She was truly a matriarch in our family. 
Definitely. What do you think she would say about where we are as a nation right now? She's been gone for many years yeah. now. How do you think she would respond to this? And what, what would she say to you if you were a young man growing up in this environment? Yeah. What would she say, do you I, think? That's a great question. I think her wisdom would come out and she would say something like this. She'd say, it's Pimpy, it was my nickname. She would say, Pimpy? Pimpy? Pimpy, Pimpy, Pimpy? was my nickname. Okay, that's another yeah. story. Another okay. story. <laughs> she would always tell me that everything happens in a process. And she would tell me that God stands outside of time and eternity. And he sees your travail and your triumph compressed into an eternal now. So as a result of that perspective, he never experiences trepidation and nor should you. My mother was 6'1 and she played basketball. I got the short dream from my dad. <laughs> but she would say, imagine you're at a basketball game and your favorite team is down by a point. There's four seconds left on the clock. You've got those high dollar seats sitting there courtside, the Rockets or the Lakers, and you can see everything. The man on your team has the ball and he's working the boundary, trying to get the ball in bounds. He's got plenty of time, four seconds, because the clock is not going to start. He can roll the ball on the ground until somebody touches it. Those four seconds won't roll. Imagine that's the context. One of your players on your team is at the other end of the court, waving their hands, saying, throw the ball to me, throw the ball to me, throw the ball to me. But you can't see them because of your perspective. Your perspective has you down courtside and all you can see is those defenders with their hands in his face. And she would say, but if you could come up and sit in those cheap seats, those high seats where your perspective changes, now you can see the man that's wide open, even though the travail is here, the triumph is here. God is calling all of us to come up to his level so we can see what the perspective he does. And when we do that, we can have patience. We can know that Although weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. And we can have consistency and personality because we know there's something more on the other end. And what we have to do is understand that though the vision tarry, we wait for it because in the end it will speak and it will not lie. And if we trust that, we can have a reasonable expectation that it's only a matter of time until what we have hoped for is going to come to pass. And when I use that word hope, that's a powerful word. My mother was not a person of blind faith. She did not operate in that realm. Everything was predicated on demonstrated ability, what God had done in her life. Mm. Therefore, I have faith for this. That bears witness to why I believe the way that I believe. And so like she would always reference scripture passages. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. When they talk about building monuments and building um, edifices that speak to what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did for you. When they see these stones, you tell them, that this is what we did. When I see Lindsay, your daughter, I know what her mother did. I know what Big Lou did to put her in a position to succeed. There's a narrative that precedes that. And when you have that bibliography and footnotes, you can run through a brick wall. There's nothing that you cannot do in those situations. So my mother would say that we're moving in this race, relation, race relations difficulty that we're dealing with right now and all of it. We're moving from scabs to scars. It's not an open wound, right? The scab is ugly, but it's better than an open wound. It's a process. Eventually, the scab will move away and the scar will be left there. Like those monuments, they are constant reminders of where we were, not where we are. That's what my mother would say. It's her ability to kind of induce a certain perspective on life that separated her from anybody I ever knew. And that transferred to me to this day. When somebody sees chaos and they see dismay, <laughs> I see opportunity. And so uh, that's what gets me excited in the morning to get up. Yeah. Your passion is palpable. Yeah. And where does that come from, do you think? You know what? I think it comes from, and again, I, hate, I know this is not a religious context here, but I think, it, Linda, it comes from understanding what it means to be created in the image of God. We can think, we can choose, we can prefer, we can decide, we can do all of these things. A tree is alive, but it doesn't have consciousness, right? We are alive. We are living, breathing, pulsating bodies of functioning, self-actualized people, right? Mm -hmm. 
that's only a fraction of what it means to be created in the image of God. To condition your behavior to affect change in your circumstances and other people's circumstances through inspiration, that is absolutely phenomenal when you think about that. So as I begin to understand what it means to be created in the image of God, man, I get on tiptoes of anticipation because I can create anything. You know, Milton the poet said, the mind is its own place and in itself can create a heaven out of hell or a hell out of heaven. I truly believe that. Hmm. You know, words created this, this, this whole atmosphere that we're in right now. You know, and I believe that as well. So what's our way out? What's, what's the one thing that you would say to leave us with a, a modicum of hope for the future? Yeah. Well, are, I, are we getting closer to the sky? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we are. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm going to, I'm just, you know, I'm not, the, as I said before, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I like to stick close to home to what I know. But what I know has come from personal experience and has come from other aspects of life. I tend to filter it through a football kind of framework to help me understand it and to share with people who think that's all I'm about, mm-hmm. help them understand that as well. But I would say this, we're, we're in what we call red zones, right? In football, the 49 the franchise I played for, Linda, had the highest rated scoring percentage inside that space from the 20 yard line in than any other team in the history of the game. And I was interested in why that was the case. Bill Walsh invited me to come on his deathbed about three months before he passed away. And he shared with me where the concept came from. And he said, Spencer, you don't understand. He said, the red zone is not a football concept. He said, red zone is life. The red zone is not so much a place on the field as much as it is a set of circumstances that puts tremendous pressure on an individual, a society, a corporation, a nation, a group of people to achieve purpose. He says, how do you know you're in a red zone? Well, you know you're in one when the need to achieve an objective is immediate. The obstacles between you and those objectives are formidable. The options available to you are limited and time is running out. Those four characteristics are exactly what we're in right now, but they have nothing to do with football. It is life. We're in that political dilemma right now. All of those circumstances are operative. The question is, do we recognize we're in a red zone? And do we have a strategy to compete and execute in that red zone? That's it. So to the degree that we're willing to discern threats, call plays to give us the best chance to succeed against those threats, and we're willing to execute those plays, and we're measuring it along the way, I'm confident about where we're headed in the future. It's when I see inertia and see people doing nothing, that's what gets me disappointed and gets the hair up on the back of my neck. We've got to be moving towards something good. Well, then then I think based on what you just said, then I think we're going to be fine because yeah, yeah. I think I see people moving. You're moving. That's what this show is about. I mean, I'm thinking what a brilliant move that you made to have people sit here. You gotta believe that somebody sitting, she went to Stanford. She's got, yeah. She doesn't think she's any better than you. She's doing what we all should be doing, taking the gifts that we have to try to illuminate our lives and our circumstances, man, because we're all in this together. Well, thank you for saying that. That is the exact (laughs) genesis of this. It was me sitting on a sofa saying, what can I do? What can I as an individual do to help move this forward? And there are, you know, millions of people across the country that are doing their own whatever it is, Mm -hmm. whether it's reaching out to someone that doesn't look like them, Mm -hmm. doesn't have the same faith and having a conversation. That's what it takes. It's all the little steps that we take together. And I see people moving. So, And can I say thank you? Oh. Because more is caught than taught. Oh. And I thank you for being who you are. I thank That's you. That's the reason why I, I named my daughter after you. So. <laughs> okay. Don't thank make you. me cry. Don't make me cry. I love you. Love thank you too. so much for coming. You bet. And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and for just being the audience and knowing that what we're bringing to you is our hearts. Yeah. So I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for giving our guest permission to speak and for having the courage to listen with an open mind. If the mission of Our Voices Matter resonates with you, please like, subscribe, download, and share, and then join the conversation because it really is going to take all of us to make a difference.